you know, the difference between a, a dream and a goal. Like a dream is just nothing. It's just gobbledygook. It's a silly, uh, a dream is just a silly thing you wish for. Uh, a goal has an associated action plan. Hi everyone, this is Jason Mark Campbell. Welcome back to the Selling with Love podcast. Now, I have a man who's just put together a book with a few of his co-founders that has absolutely blown my mind. It's one of my favorite books I've read in a long time, really getting you excited about the startup story of people that are just crazy enough to believe in an idea and not just settle for the small things, but really make huge, big plans and transform lives in the process. Author of Make No Small Plans, I have Elliot Bisno, who is here, co-founder of The Summit, building a diverse and inspiring community of passionate, generous people. Um, if any of you have not heard of Summit, this is like one of the most incredible events that happened either on Powder Mountain, they happened on a yacht, not a yacht, but a, a cruise ship. They've done this in LA where they took over the entire city and brought amazing people together, creating impact and educating entrepreneurs and really fostering connection and community. A huge movement that our world needs now more than ever as we're trying to raise consciousness on the planet. I have the one and only Elliot Bisnow with me. Elliot, welcome to the show. I'm here, Jason. Here we are. Let's do it. I I had to start like, I don't think you're sane. I think you're a little crazy. I, I was going through your book and some of the first things that happened, like the amount of conviction, uh, boldness that you had to take on at the beginning of your journey was absolutely mind blowing. And I just want to start from there, which is an interesting place to start, which is, can you start a business with big plans? without having a little bit of crazy within your soul? Well, I think the first thing is that not all risk taking is the same. And you can't just categorize things as you're either taking a risk or you're not taking a risk. And I think the risks that we took earlier were more reputational risks. I think, you know, we did start quite small, like our first event was um, 19 people. And the entire budget was $30,000. And, um, you know, we didn't start trying to put on a festival with thousands of people and multi-million dollar budget. So, you know, we often think that if you want to think big, the best way is to start small, right? If you want to walk across America, like by definition, you need to start with the first step and the first mile and the first 10 miles. So I think no matter what you do, um, there's often a path to start thoughtfully, and um, in a way where if it blows up in your face, maybe you're losing a few thousand dollars or tens of thousands of dollars, um, but you're not mortgaging your family's house and you're not doing something that can just absolutely, um, you know, blow up in your face. But yeah, mm -hmm. do you have to be a little crazy? Um, you have to be a, you have to be a bit audacious because anything that you would have the idea to start would either not exist or not. Uh, be done well. Otherwise, there would be no purpose to start it. Like if you wanted to start a sandwich shop in your town, you know, or a specific business in your town, then it wouldn't exist. So you would have to do something that nobody else had done. What was it that when you noticed when you got inspired? You, I mean, you went and created Summit Group, you're gathering these amazing entrepreneurs. It started with you identifying that there was a big gap. And I'd love for you to highlight a bit more of what is it that you had noticed that made it so that Summit was an eventuality, it needed to be created, and you happened to be the catalyst to make it happen in a beautiful way. Well, there's a great concept that the problem is the solution. And so I had started a business with my dad. And I had a problem, which is we had a little startup and I realized I didn't know anything and I didn't know any people. And when I mean anything, typical college kid wanting to start a business, I didn't know how to put systems in place. I didn't know how to hire people. I didn't know how to create a company culture. I didn't know how to create an org chart. You know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, understand how to keep the books. Like here we were starting a business and I did not know anything. And that was the problem. And the solution was I needed to meet people. And so what happened was I decided to cold call other entrepreneurs who I'd read about. And so my problem that, well, I don't know anything and I need mentorship and I need other entrepreneurs to give me advice and coach me became the solution, 
which was, okay, well, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to cold call people that I've read about. And I'm what, what am I going to cold call them about? I'm going to invite them on a ski trip. And this was the impetus for the first ever Summit Series event. So I cold called these folks and said, hi, uh, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm 21 years old. I just left college. I'm building my dream. I'm trying to meet other entrepreneurs. And I think that whereas to my friends from high school who saw me as not an entrepreneur who went to college, who dropped out, they thought, saw me kind of as a goofball and, a, you know, a kind of clueless person. These people who never met me, they saw me as this entrepreneur. And the other interesting thing, Jason, is when I called entrepreneurially minded people, they were willing to take a bit of a risk and go on this trip that I invited them on. So that was it. I had a problem. I was 21. I wanted to start a business. I didn't know anybody. I cold called people I read about. I offered to pay for a trip for 20 people to go skiing. People started saying yes. I got some sponsors that I cold called as well to cover part of the cost of the trip. And we were off. That was the first summit event. It was such a fascinating journey. And I think you do quote in your book how sometimes you have to go with ready, fire, and aim. And it feels like one of the first things you've done really well whenever you were putting on these events, especially at the beginning, is you would t personally take responsibility of doing these cold calls, doing the sales that needed to happen, whether it was to bring the guests to the event or to raise money from the sponsor. And so it seems like the sales aspect was something that you already had familiarity with. And I'd want you to talk more about, you know, what did you have as a background in sales and how important was that to the success of everything you've created? Well, I had no background in sales and there were a couple of books that I read that definitely changed my life when it came to sales. There was a book called Question Based Selling that the key to sales is asking questions. And I think when I got into selling, I just talked all the time. And when you ask questions, it's not so much as a tactic. It's that if you want to sell someone something, you actually need to know what they want to buy. You actually need to understand why are they in the toy store? Well, what are they looking for? How old are their kids? What, you know, what, what's their, you know, budget? I read a book, um, called Secrets of Great Rainmakers, which was a really simple book. I think it was by Jeffrey Fox. Um, you know, wake up every, what does the great salesperson do? You know, they wake up every day, they clap their hands. They're excited to get no's because then they actually know who they can continue to reach out to. So they, you know, they are not afraid to ask for the sale. You know, it just, it talked about a lot of the principles of sales. And then I just had to hit the phones and I learned quickly that cold calling is a really terrible way to make sales and that there are a lot of techniques like warm calling, you know, where you can kind of, you know, send emails ahead of time, letting them know that you want to reach out or ideally getting introductions and asking folks who are interested in your product. Oh, you're already coming to my toy store. Are there other, you know, people you'd want to bring to the toy store? Um, oh, you know, you're a patron at the restaurant, you know, here's a, a coupon code. If you want to bring friends, we're doing this discount night every Tuesday. So really the best way that you can, you know, sell any product is through introductions or referrals. And that's how with the summit community, we built the community for the most part, like it started with cold calls, but then once you have a product, in our case, it was an event, people come to the event, they can experience it, they can judge for themselves. Maybe some people it's not right for them, but the people where it's right, they can then refer that to other people. I think it's almost for the beginning, you needed to go through the grind of the cold call to get those first yeses. And as you mentioned, it's probably not the most exciting thing to do, but I've often heard from my community, especially those with a lot of sales reluctance, they're like, yeah, this whole like cold calling or doing the sales part is just not for me. It's just not something I want to do. Maybe I can hire someone else to do that instead. Uh, but you've kept your hands on the pulse quite closely. And I'm wondering if you feel like this is a necessary for someone who's in business or it's actually something you feel could be actually delegated out if you feel like it has nothing to do with you. Well, sure. I mean, you could you, you could and you should delegate and assign responsibility to people who enjoy those roles. Like if you like writing and you're more introverted, but you're a brilliant copywriter, you probably shouldn't be cold calling. And if you're great at sales and you just wake up every day and you find it riveting, 
you know, to be on the phone with all these people and you're not a great copywriter, you should probably do the cold calling. Again, we really quickly realized that that cold, straight up cold calling is is not a very good idea. Um, you know, if you are going to cold call or send cold emails, you need to very thoughtfully reach out to people who will reply. And where cold calling and cold emails can work well is reaching out to someone who's actually a peer. You, Jason, Mark Campbell, reaching out to another podcast host that you don't know. Somebody, you know, who's kind of at your level in your peer group. Me, Elliot, event producer, reaching out to another event producer at my level. Hey, I'm Elliot. I produce events. I really wanted to meet you. Here's some press about me. So I still do cold call and mostly cold email all the time, but it's really people who are my peers, you know, and I think it's what's extremely difficult is just cold emailing some CMO of some big brand trying to, you know, close some deal, right? Or, um, you know, us trying to cold email a big speaker to get to summit, like they will never reply. So I'm all for people cold emailing and cold calling, but it, it really has to be for your peers. Otherwise, it just, it won't work. It's one in a thousand. It's a total waste of time. You know, Summit's grown. It's got some of the best speakers in the industry, the most amazing event. Uh, and for someone who used to run the events out at Mind Valley, you know, we threw up AFEST and that's one of the big events on our side. Summit is the other holy grail I find in the event space of doing something absolutely magical. And in your case, you actually got together with a few of your friends and people you've met that have become your business partners. And I wanted to understand, like, how was it for you making the decision to bring on partners as opposed to employees at those early stages of the business? Yeah, it was also a big deal for me going to events early in my career as well. Huge game changer. I went to the first ever Awesomeness Festival. Um, And I actually uh, saw a speaker there, Sean Stevenson, the three foot giant, who we became friends and changed my life and spoke at Summit. And so I've always, you know, taken like my hard earned money and invested it in things that could impact my personal growth or my business development. So I would go and spend my money on events. I've, you know, bought tickets to the TED conference before. I've um, bought tickets to, you know, music festivals. I've been to Burning Man. Um, You know, uh, we own a ski resort, Powder Mountain. I've, you know, bought ski tickets and skied at lots of ski resorts. So I'm definitely a big proponent of, you know, spending a thoughtful amount of money. Don't go crazy, but, you know, whether it's on books or events, or, you know, getting a flight somewhere to tour uh, a company that does something that you're inspired by. You know, maybe you're you want to buy a bunch of residential real estate, and you get a connection, fly to a different city and meet someone and see what they're building. I think to answer your question, I've always enjoyed having business partners. I would find, you know, going to play golf by myself, pretty boring. Like, uh, even though I could, uh, or going on a bicycle ride by myself, like just in general, I don't love spending lots and lots of time by myself. I spent a little time, um, or going on a, a, a two week trip. Do I really want to go solo? Not, not really. And then a business is just like the most complex, difficult up and down thing you're going to spend a decade of your life on. So to have no true partners, I think is challenging. I think some people's personality types are just not right for partners. Um, I also think people become your co-founders and partners at the beginning. And, you know, you can definitely have people who are employees who are just as valuable as your partners and your co-founders and you trust them just as much. But I think, you know, when you start the business and it's the very beginning and, you know, nobody believes in your idea, there is something special about that initial group that rolls up their sleeves and goes to work building it for you. And, you know, it can often be really hard to even hire employees for a couple of years. You know, I think we read about all these Silicon Valley venture startups with two friends who start a company and they raise a seed round of a million dollars and, you know, nine months later, an A round of 10 million and they scale to 30 people. Like, that's definitely not reality. Um, And that is not my reality. Like our first company I started in college, it was just me and my dad. And then, you know, it was like nine months later, you know, a friend I knew from tennis, 
you know, started doing our tech work. And someone else I knew from tennis started helping with sales. And someone my dad knew helped do an admin stuff. And it was like, you know, a year, you know, year and a half. I just had a few people, you know, with Summit. It was just me and my co-founders for a couple years. You know, it was, you know, it was a big deal when the first employee joined. Um, and that was really over two years into the business, right? So that's just, that's my reality. And so these people who are my partners and co-founders, it's just not, it's not an arbitrary title and it's not like, oh, do I want them or not? It's like, we had like two plus years, grueling years where like we paid when, when they joined, I think we paid them $2,000 a month for the first couple, you know, the first six months. Right. This is just grueling, man. Just who is willing to join and go through this two year slog of two grand a month? And we shared beds at one point, you know, I shared with uh, with Jeff. We, we had to put a pillow between us and we shared a bed at Brett's grandmother's house, you know, so um, like we weren't even making enough money to live in America. Um, we went to Nicaragua at one point and, uh, you know, finally got our own rooms. Actually, I still shared a room with Jeff, um, and uh, but we had our own beds. <laughs> <laughs> Moving up, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I love this whole story and how it, it, it unfolds. And there's so much things that, you know, from the beginning, we've seen you starting from the, the smaller event, then it escalated to something bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, the whole book talking about make no small plans, it could be mistaken that what you're supposed to do when you get started is have a really big plan and a crystal clear vision of exactly where you're going right from the start. And I feel like that would be a nuance that people would miss from the point that you're making in the book. Would you be able to elaborate on what is the make no small plans and does it parallel to being so clear on the big future or not? Well, I think if all you do is read the cover of the book and see make no small plans, and that's all you do. You definitely, like you said, might get the wrong impression um, because the idea is not just to make crazy uh, ideas with no game plan. You know, the, uh, you know, the difference between a, a dream and a goal, like a dream is just nothing. It's just gobbledygook. It's a silly, uh, <laughs> a dream is just a silly thing you wish for. Uh, a goal has an associated action plan. A goal has an associated action plan. And I think the idea of make no small plans uh, is, is to really step back and look at your life and think about, you know, what are the plans that you want to live? Um, it's certainly not a book about starting businesses. It's not a book about having tons of employees. It's a book about objectively looking at your life and saying, like, what was the plan for my life? You know, was my plan to teach? And why am I not doing that? You know, was my plan to write a book? You know, was my plan to become an artist? Was my plan to just, you know, learn how to play guitar? And I never made that big plan. Was my plan that I always want to start a nonprofit and I just never did that? Um, you know, did I want to start a music festival and I never did that? I mean, I think we're all so different. And so to be able to objectively look at your life and just ask yourself, like, what was the big plan that you wanted to make? And look, I think our story, Jason, it, it's just very relatable. It's like four guys, two of us, including me, did not graduate from college. Our business is very easy to understand, putting on events, building kind of, you know, a new age business festival type conference that didn't exist, right? There are all these kind of boring business conferences on one end of the spectrum that went from, you know, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and they ended. And then there were, you know, big music festivals, drugged out music festivals and nothing between. So the idea to build, you know, events for a new generation of entrepreneurs, like it's just a very simple, easy to understand business. And our story is simple and easy and relatable. And so I think we use the lens of our story to show to people how, you know, they can objectively look at their lives and make their own, you know, you know, their own plans for where they want to go. I love that. And one of the things I want to bring up is 
throughout the book, like every single chapter, the whole thing, I always feel like I'm left on that last episode of Lost where there's such a cliffhanger that I need to keep <laughs> going. So I will give a warning to anyone who goes out and picks up a copy of this book. I will put a link in the show notes and I would highly recommend it if you want to learn a ton about building this business, building something incredible, not making small plans, having big visions and realizing what aligns when you think bigger. But every end of chapter, there was something stressful, crazy that was happening. And it seems like this is something that has happened many times. And I was just thinking about what kind of emotional resilience was required, or at least a mindset, belief mindset that was required to go through all these different challenges, like something like raising millions or tens of millions of dollars with a one week deadline, I remember was happening when it came to buying your Powder Mountain ski resort, which was a crazy plan in itself as well. And I just want to know how do you, how important did you see your own mindset, the mindset of the team or anything that really helped you keep pushing, even though it seemed like things were hopeless at so many little stages when it all came together beautifully at the last minute? Well, this is why it's so great to have partners and people you really trust, because I think, um, you know, partners are people who can stand shoulder to shoulder with you and really help lift you up. And, you know, I think we would have just a lot of stress, even when we did everything right, when the event is finally coming together, but you know, seven, 750 people are showing up in 24 hours and speakers are canceling and musicians are canceling and, you know, venues are getting rooming lists wrong and we're losing things and things are delayed in the mail. And no matter how right it would go, it would be very hard. You know, I think with the live events business, right, we'd only have a couple events a year, sometimes just one event a year, right? It felt like it felt like the Olympics where you train for four years to get to run the 100 meter dash and, and you have 10 seconds in four years, you know, and, you know, we would have one event a year and, you know, sometimes two events and then that was it. And there suddenly everyone was coming and you could feel the energy of, of, you know, the days before, you know, people are canceling, new people want to get in, room, you know, rooming changes. And it just, it's like drinking from a fire hose. And, you know, it's not the kind of thing you want to be doing alone. You want to have partners that you, you know, you can be open with and transparent with and um, who can help you get through uh, the challenges and you can really, you know, win with them, lose with them, you know, but ultimately move forward with them. I feel you. I mean, as I mentioned, I was part of the events team at Mindvalley and we were leading some crazy new things as well. And I think I, those are the people I've bonded with the absolute most, like going through those challenges together just brought us so much closer. And even though I left mine Valley, I still keep in touch with everyone on that team. Cause we've, we've went through things we wouldn't wish on others in the process of putting together some crazy events. And, you know, I think I, I appreciate what you're saying about not having to go do it alone, whether it's with co-founders or with at least a core team where you're in this together, you're going through the grind. I don't think events ever happen flawlessly. There's always a something crazy, something magical that happens, but it seems to pull together in a way that, you know, creates the story for the next one. Uh, and I definitely appreciated that by going through the book. I, I wanted to see since this book actually ends, I believe it's around 2013. And that's almost nine years ago, or if it's more than nine years ago. And I'd be very curious to know from that moment where the book ends, you guys just acquired a ski resort powder mountain as the home base for summit. And I know there's been tons of things that have been happening in the last nine years. And I'd be curious to know if there's some new lessons or things that have happened since the end of the book and that you've discovered as a lesson up until now that you feel would be important to share for anybody who's going into business, doing this kind of startup, whether it's in events or not, but just going out and making a big plan of something crazy. Well, look, first of all, writing a book was amazing. And for anyone thinking about writing a book, I cannot recommend it highly enough you know, you don't have to have a publisher, just writing a book is incredible. And I think figuring out the structure of the book was also a blast that took months and months. But when you actually think about how different books are written, not every book, and in fact, most books are not just memoirs of this, you know, unless you're a really famous person, you don't just write a memoir. And even like Jason, and I were talking about this book, Shoe Dog, about the founder of Nike, you know, that book is about the early, you know, days in high school, in college, just out of college, making the Nike sneakers, you know, with his family's waffle iron in their garage. And it ends in 1981. Can you believe a book about Nike just came out and didn't talk about 19, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s? Like, he skipped the last 40 years um, because the early days are so fun. And that's what we did, right? Our book is basically this 
incredibly invigorating time period from 2008 to 2013, about five years of our journey, when we had zero connections, zero relationships, zero money. We didn't have a brand. We never produced events. And it ends after having, you know, hosted people like, you know, Richard Branson, President Clinton, uh, chartered cruise ships, had, you know, you know, tens of thousands of people come to our events. And it ends the day we sign a deal to buy Powder Mountain in 2013. And so I think, you know, those first years are just so invigorating. Like, how did we create the summit name? How do we create the summit brand and identity? And, the, the, you know, the summit logo? How did we build our team? What were the biggest problems that we ran into in the early days? And, you know, those early days were just so invigorating uh, because we had a really small, nimble team. You know, eventually it got up to about 20 people before 2013. And I think since then, like probably the biggest takeaway, like any company as it, you know, matures is everything just gets more dialed in. You end up taking you know, fewer risks or, or more thoughtful risks with, you know, less upside, you know, less, less, I'd say less downside, hopefully more upside, like you're more calculated with your risk. Um, everything gets professionalized, you really, you know, focus on the, you know, operations and the systems. And so I think a lot of the things that happen as a business grows are just less fun. Um, they're more boring. And, uh, and so yeah, that's why we decided, uh, you know, to tell this story of the early days, because it's just, it's just so every single day was invigorating. Elliot, I absolutely love it. And again, I'm stressing this big time because I, I, I'm swearing that this is one of the most fun books I've read in a long time. So for everybody listening to this, definitely grab a copy of Make No Small Plans. I have a link in the show notes, definitely want to pick it up Amazon or wherever you want to buy your books. Uh, I went through an audible experience, which is actually read by you. So I ah. do recognize your voice very <laughs> strongly. I just finished recording the audiobook for my book last night. And so as I'm listening to you, I was like inspired because I would have to say you've done a stellar performance in your audiobook reading. Um, so I was inspired to bring my A game as well. For everyone else, I, I want to make sure I finish with the one question that I always get to ask these amazing guests that I get to bring on my show. So Elliot, I have to ask you this one. You are on the Selling with Love podcast. So I have to ask you, what would selling with love mean to you? Well, how you do anything is how you do everything. So just in my life, I'm all about asking questions and listening. And I heard a great quote once. I heard someone ask somebody, uh, like, why, why don't you remember people's, like someone said, like, how do you uh, remember people's names? Like, you know, every person's name, John and Sarah and Megan and Mark and Derek, how do you remember their names? And they said, well, I just really care about each person. So how could I forget their names? And I think, you know, selling with love is like really caring about each person you're calling. They're not just a phone call. They're a human being. And, you know, you're asking them questions. You're, you know, authentically listening to the answers. If it's not right, then you're not trying to sell them. Um, and you're trying to build real relationships. Um, that's what, you know, that's to me what, you know, sell, selling is about. Elliot. Thank you so much for your time. For everybody listening, again, the biggest takeaways I've taken from here is from the beginning, you know, I wanted to push on this idea is making big plans, something like going out dreaming, as Elliot mentioned, is if you can have big dreams and big plans, it has to be executed one step at a time. And even the way that they began with Summit, they actually start with a small group so that they could go forward, less risk, but do it boldly, grow and grow and grow. But they've always pushed the envelope every single time. They started finding more ways to be effective in reaching out. And one of the big things we have here is cold calling can be the way to start, but not the most effective way to sell. Look if you can find some people to you can be introduced to referrals ends up being a better way of growing the network. You make one sale, it leads to the others. We also discussed a bit about what does it look like when you have partners on board? Why is it a preference for you to have people that go along the journey with you? a sounding board and other people with you going to build this business because it will be hard ends up being a very powerful thing to support you on your journey. Although it is a caveat, Elliot speaks that it's not just for everybody, but based on your personality, that might be the best way you want to grow. And it definitely makes the journey a lot more fun. 
I love everything we've talked about, making big plans. Yes, you want to be bold. You don't want to be crazy. And the beginning times are going to be your most exciting times. So enjoy it, cherish it, go and take some risks, build something incredible. The world has some problems to solve. And I think it starts with one person or a small group of crazy people making a plan to solve those problems in a big way and taking it one step at a time. Make no small plan. Grab a copy of that book. I've mentioned it a few times. So I'm mentioning it once again. You will have a great learning experience, an amazing story to discover. And of course, definitely check out the Summit Group and all their amazing events. I am looking forward to going to one of my first series, Summit, Powder Mountain, whatever events are coming up. I need to look at your schedule because I've been in the space in the Mind Valley bubble. I definitely need to go and explore some different bubbles because you've amassed an amazing, incredible community and looking forward to being a part of it. Thank you so much, Elliot, for your time. Fantastic. Thank you. I am your host, Jason Mark Campbell, and this is the Selling with Love podcast.